Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, where we'll be covering the August payrolls report and where expectations are, I think, fairly, fairly elevated that um, today's payrolls number will seal or put the seal on a Fed pause later this month. The, the, the next Fed meeting is around about the 20th, 21st of September, 21st of September. I think it's the 20th actually thinking about it. Um, and obviously we also have um, another CPI report to come, but certainly from the data that we've seen thus far this week, um, bond markets appear to think that we've probably seen a top in yields. The bigger question now is how long we stay at current levels. If we look at the US 10 year this week alone, we've seen a big retreat from the levels that we saw earlier this year. And if we actually go back longer than that, um, say for example, 10 years, we have potentially got a little bit of a double top around about the current levels that we saw earlier this week. We've seen a similar decline in gilt yields as well, UK gilt yields, which would appear to suggest that really now we're in the home stretch of where the possible terminal rate is for not only Fed funds, but also the Bank of England and the ECB. You know, and, and this month I think is going to be very, very important in the context of where rates end up over the course of the next two or three months. So a soft payrolls report, I think, is going to be important in that context. It will confirm the narrative that we've seen so far this week that the US economy is slowing. We've seen the jolts data, the job openings data, fall to the lowest level since March 2021. That doesn't mean that, however, that the US jobs market can't still remain reasonably resilient. We have to look at the data in the round. We can't just focus on one piece of data. The ADP payrolls report earlier this week was also um, a fairly weak one, but you also have to remember that the two months preceding that were fairly strong, um, but 177 is heading in the right direction. Weekly jobless claims, around about 230,000, so they're still fairly low, though continuing claims are starting to head higher. And the unemployment rate is at three and a half percent. You know, and you know, the Federal Reserve has the end of year unemployment rate at four percent. Well, they're running out of months for that unemployment rate to head higher. So, you know, when we look at that and we look at the fact that inflation edged higher in August, then You've got to, you've got to, you've got to basically look at today's payrolls report in that context, and it's not just about the headline number; it's also about these figures here, 4.4 percent. I'm hoping you can see and hear everything that I'm talking about at the moment. Please tell me if you can't. Well, obviously you can't if you can't hear me, but you can certainly tell me if you can't if you can't see. Um, but certainly in the context of wages, because wages are still fairly sticky. But I think there's been a realignment this week in central banks' um, thought processes when it comes to how many more rate hikes are needed, given the data that we've seen, particularly when it comes to PMIs. Um, if you look at the PMIs that we saw today um, in the manufacturing sector, Manufacturing in Europe has now been in contraction pretty much for the last 11 months. So, um, you know, how much more damage do you want to do is the question that essentially central bankers want, need to be asking themselves when services, which we've got next week um, on the 5th of September, when services is also starting to, see, starting to move in, con into contraction territory. So Hugh Pill's comments yesterday, and he's chief economist at the Bank of England, and he's posted, he's, he, there's a piece in the FT today on the fact that he probably thinks that UK rate policy is restrictive enough and therefore no more rate rises are needed. And I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think central banks are done and now it's really a question of 
how high, you know, how long do they stay at current levels? Which is why um, Hugh Pill drew a table mountain analogy when he talks about the longevity or a plateau for the current level of interest rates. How long do rates have to stay at current levels for inflation to start falling back to target? There's also been some chatter about central banks revising their inflation targets um, up from the current 2% um, to say a level which is much more realistic, say 3%. Now, I think that would be a mistake because what that does is you might as well just say, well, we can't reach the current inflation target, so let's move it. The time to have moved it would have been when inflation was below 2%, not while it's missing by a mile, because essentially what you're saying is we're just going to move the goalposts, and that's not that's not a place where you really want to be when you're a central banker. Okay, so in terms of what we're looking for today on the payrolls numbers, um, we're looking for a slight moderation from the 187,000 jobs that were added in July. There's certainly going to be some seasonal factors at play in the August payrolls numbers, which does suggest that we may well see um, a lower number. But I also wouldn't rule out a higher number because ultimately, at the end of the day, a lot of these numbers get revised away. You get revisions up, you get revisions down. Uh, you know, and for me, I think what we need to see today is just a a number that supports the prevailing narrative that has seen yields retreat this week. Um, so that suggests to me that anything that comes in in line in, in line with consensus is probably going to be a good thing. Now, earlier before I started recording, I was asked a question: assuming markets um, react positively. If the, if the numbers are not too strong, how much of a miss would be worrisome and actually cause a pullback? Um, a miss to the upside, so if we get a number of 250,000, a really strong number, that would prompt a little bit of a pullback in the rebound that we've seen off the lows for stock markets because ultimately it would keep the prospect of an additional rate hike from the Federal Reserve very much on the table. The US, US labor market is still fairly tight. It's still really strong. Job openings are still well above um, pre-pandemic levels. Um, job openings are around about seven, seven and a half million leading into the pandemic. They're still at 8.8 .8 million now. And the unemployment rate is the same level it was a year ago when Jay Powell at Jackson Hole said that he would have to inflict much more pain on the US economy in terms of higher rates. You know, I think if you'd asked Jay Powell um, a year ago that he would have an unemployment rate at three and a half percent at the same level as it was when he made that Jackson Hole speech in 2022, he'd have taken that and he'd have, pro he'd have probably ripped your arm off. Um, so certainly I think in terms of the unemployment numbers, the Fed is in a good place. So there is a there is a thought process that might lead them to think that they can get away with another rate hike. I think that would be a mistake, certainly in terms of the numbers that we've seen, um, certainly in terms of the numbers that we've seen thus far. Um, just been asked about dollar yen. Absolutely, I'll, I'll actually get rid of the euro dollar chart and I'll talk about that now because this is one particular call that I've really got around my ears this year because I really thought that dollar yen would go an awful lot lower from um, these sorts of levels here. In any event, we've gone higher. Um, we've retested the 147.50 area, but I, I struggle. I really struggle with this. I really struggle with the fact that dollar yen is 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 currently where it is right now. Um, we got the Bank of Japan later this month. I think it's inevitable that the Bank of Japan will have to, at some point, start to pull back from its very easy monetary policy. I also think that ultimately, if the Fed does call a halt to rate hikes, the dollar will have to go lower. Um, but of course, you know, you've got a push pull effect here. At the moment, I'm still favoring dollar yet, selling dollar yen on rallies, but I've been saying that all year and got it completely wrong. So, you know, I, I would strongly advise you don't take my advice. Um, but my gut instinct is that we could well drift lower towards the, into, into year end. Um, but will we get a sharp sell-off? 
you know, it's 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 a, it's a tough one because essentially what I'm encouraging you to do is trade against the underlying trend, which is buy the dips on dollar yen. But this area here around about 147, you know, it feels a little bit toppy at the moment, but we need to get back below this two twin lows here at 144 and a half. If we can push back below there, then I'd probably feel slightly more confident that perhaps the top is in. If we look at, say, for example, let's try and look at a weekly chart to see whether or not we've got any indication here. I mean, we could have the makings of a bullish reversal here, but we had that there. We dropped down, we bounced off uh, the 50 week moving average and then subsequently rebounded again. So certainly the trend is for dolly to move higher. But if we drop below 144 and a half, then I think we could see an acceleration back towards the 50 day moving average and consequently back to this Ichimoku cloud support in and around there. Um, so, um, so that's dollar yen. I'm, I'm still very minded to think selling on rallies in terms of dollar yen. Um, WTI, I thought that, I thought that WTI was something else there for a minute. But yeah, and I thought that was an, an F not an I, but okay. <laughs> WTI. Uh, yeah, I mean, oil prices, that's another thing that really bothers me slightly. I think the fact that we started to break higher, we could see a squeeze towards $90 a barrel there. Um, I think the fact that you've got OPEC and OPEC Plus continuing to double down on their production cuts, I think that's likely to exert upward pressure on oil prices. We're seeing it in Brent. We're seeing it in WTI. But I, I still can't bring myself to be overly bullish on crude, whether it be WTI or Brent, because at some point um, you're going to create problems for consumption going forward. The big level for me, I think, is on Brent. I think if we can hold below $90 a barrel, I'm still very much of the opinion that we're range bound and ultimately we will remain range bound. I don't think it's in anyone's interests for production cuts to basically push the global economy into recession. But then again, you know, whoever said that OPEC plus policy was based in common sense, it probably isn't. Um, would Euro Yen, is Euro Yen a better bet for being a short than Dollar Yen? Well, certainly on the basis of this chart, you'd have to argue yes, because you've got a very big bearish reversal on the dailies there. Um, we've reversed that quite significantly. Um, maybe a short position with a stop above 160, perhaps. Certainly there is scope for that, but given the volatility in dollar yen or, or euro yen, you know, you have to question whether or not um, you could probably get away with that. But yeah, I mean, yen crosses do feel a little bit toppy at these sorts of levels, just particularly on the basis of dollar yen. Um, so, Hopefully that answers your question. As I say, I mean, I used to trade dollar yen, so I'm probably more comfortable um, trading dollar yen than I am euro yen. Um, if I was going to trade, if I had to choose between the two, I'd probably use dollar yen because it's probably more within my comfort zone. And I think you, I think that's what you really need to do. You need to trade what's within your own comfort zone um, rather than looking at a cross. I mean, one of the one of the crosses that I actually was quite um, good at trading in a past life was Swiss yen. But if we look at Swiss yen, um, that is really a pain trade, if ever I saw one, uh, particularly if we look at this chart here. Let's just add a, um, a slow stochastic to that and a couple of moving averages. There we go. I mean, if that's not overextended, I don't know what is. I mean, maybe a short Swiss yen position would probably be more because you've definitely got a double top coming in there with solid support at around about 164.40. So, you know, maybe Swiss yen perhaps would be um, the way to go when it comes to a short position. And there, there, there's, 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 there's another option for you perhaps. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, so digressing, is there anything else that you guys want me to cover before we go into the numbers? Euro dollar, I'm going to quickly look at Euro dollar because it's got a really decent trend line here, which is so far has managed to hold any dips in Euro dollar. We joined the lows from March this year, 200 day moving average there, 
We've also got around about the 107.80 level round about here. So this area around here is a fairly key support when it comes to euro dollar. We've got fairly decent resistance at 109.40.50. I think that's probably going to contain any move that we see today on the non-farm payrolls. Um, certainly, I think in terms of what we've seen so far this week, we've seen some fairly decent um, we've seen some fairly decent uh, moves this week. But I think if we look at this particular chart on the weeklies, we some, we've seen some significant euro weakness, and I would be surprised if we see further euro weakness much before um, this month's central bank rate meetings. We'll have to wait and see what the prevailing narrative is and over the course of um, the next couple of weeks when the ECB meets on the 14th of September. In terms of equity markets, still looking fairly well supported. S&P 500 looking fairly decent at the moment, but again, you know, we're sort of retesting the peaks of this week. You know, have we got any prospect of further momentum? FTSE 100, I'm quickly going to rattle through these before the numbers. We've got two minutes left. Again, 7,200, huge level on the FTSE 100. We've rounded off that three, four times this year. And the biggest concern I have, obviously, is the fact that these highs are getting lower. So momentum is starting to fade. But I'm encouraged by the fact that that 7,200 level has held fairly well over the course of the last few months. And hopefully that will continue to do so. The DAX, still very much range bound, fairly decent support in and around these lows around here, as well as the 200 day moving average. It's finding a few offers around about 16,000 and these highs all the way through here. So again, very much towards the top of the range when it comes to the DAX. My feeling is that the numbers today will probably come in in line with expectations and then the focus will shift to what comes up over the course of the next couple of weeks. Of course, I could be horribly wrong and we could get a huge miss either to the upside or to the downside. Um, let's have a quick look at, let's just keep dolly yen on the screen and just look at a five minute chart to see what the initial reaction is when it comes to, but dolly yen is looking a little bit soft on this. Um, NASDAQ, yep, thank you, sir. I almost forgot that, NASDAQ. Let's quickly bring that up. Again, we're sort of retesting the highs, looking a little bit, again, looking a little bit toppy around current levels. Let's see if I can draw a trend line in through these peaks here, whether or not no, we've broken that. So I would say that I, was, I do struggle with the idea that we can potentially retest the highs, but, you know, nothing is out of the question when it comes to the NASDAQ. It's got a bit of a mind of its own. OK, I'm going to be quiet now. Um, we can see what we're expecting. The numbers are about to break right now. OK, Canadian GPs, just GDPs come out. 3.8, that's a big jump in the unemployment rate to 3.8%. Um, that's what it's reacting to, 187,000. Revision down for the previous month to 157. So that, that sort of supports the slowdown in the US economy, weaker dollar, um, and, and really supports the narrative that the Fed is probably done when it comes to rate hikes. And the dollar reaction is pretty much bearing that out. Average earnings are also, average hourly earnings are also weaker as well. So that certainly, bit, that certainly supports the idea of a certainly supports the idea of Fed being rates. So let's see how markets are reacting. We know we've got a weaker dollar. Let's look at equities. Get that now. And yet, as, as suspected, we've got we've got to move higher in equity markets. So pretty much going according to plan when it comes to the market reaction to those numbers. Speaking to a slow slowdown in the U.S. economy, good for risk, um, good for bond markets, lower yields. 
and buying into the idea that we're going to get a pause in September with the possibility that as we look towards the end of the year, as long as inflation continues to come down, we will see um, we'll probably see the Fed we'll probably see that the, 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 the Fed the Fed is actually the Fed is actually done when it comes to when it comes to raising rates. And then really now it's the question is how long will rates stay at the levels that they're currently at? So four point three one eight seven three point eight. Okay. So it's pretty much played out as we suspected it might. Okay. Any other questions, ladies and gents? I don't think I've really got much to add. Let's have a quick look at bond yields. So let's look at the one day on the ten year. Sharp move lower on that. Let's look at the two year. Again, another big drop, nine basis points on that. Let's quickly look at two year. We've seen a big fall there over the course of the past few days. So there's a definite narrative unfolding here. Look at the weekly. I mean, these are big bearish reversals in all of the charts when it comes to yields you know and it feeds into the narrative that potentially rates have peaked so i'm looking at some of the uh outlines on some of the headlines rather not outlines, headlines on my bloomberg trucking payrolls fell 37,000, reflecting business closures obviously that was yellow um the shutdown there gold's up not surprisingly the downward revision to july was quite significant and june was revised to 105 so the june payrolls numbers revised lower july revised lower and unemployment up to 3.8 i'm just going to have a quick look at the participation rate to see whether or not that had a significant impact on why the unemployment rate went up because if we've seen more people return to the workforce that could certainly feed into a narrative that so if we look there and that's up that's up by 0.2 percent so 0.2 percent of that increase in the unemployment rate was an increase in the labor participation rate of 0.2 percent so we've gone um from 3.5 to 3.8 and we've gone from 62.6 to 62.8, and that's the highest since pre-COVID when we were at 63.7. So we're now 0.9% 9, 9 below the COVID, pre-COVID, pre-participation pre rate. So people are now being forced back into the workforce by, um, by the cost of living squeeze, by higher interest rates, and consequently that's being reflected in a higher unemployment rate though not you obviously you've got 0.1 percent on top of that as well so so yeah positive for, positive for equity markets the markets are now pricing in lower yields lower dollar and higher equity markets and the next penny to drop will be how much more of the rate hikes that currently haven't been felt in the markets will slow down the economy in the second half of this year right next week we've got bank of canada rate meetings we've got rba rate meetings they're going to set us up for um, ecb bank of england federal reserve in subsequent weeks but ultimately i think no change bank of canada five percent no change rba 4.1 percent no change ecb um, and what was actually particularly interesting is something that came up on the bloomberg was that traders have paired bank of england bets to 25 basis point hikes and no longer fully priced in the wake of those numbers well that's an interesting that's an interesting tip bit of information isn't it so um, the market is now pricing in a much lower terminal rate for the bank of england as well and that's all in the space of around about 25 30 minutes just because um, the us payrolls numbers have seen not only a weak as expected 
August number, but we've seen downward revisions to June and July. Okay, so any more questions, ladies and gents, on anything else that I haven't quite covered? I'm just going to quickly look at gold in the wake of those numbers. Uh, this is quite, in, this is really interesting here because now we've broken to the highest levels um, since the beginning of August. So one month highs on gold. We now draw a trend line through these levels through here. I don't like that line. It's too high. Probably going to draw it off there. But by any stretch of the imagination, we could well be heading back towards this series of peaks through the end of July 1960. But the direction of travel does look to be clear. Also, what we've got is the 50 day moving average starting to flatten out and look positive. 200 day is already um, pointing in the right direction. Momentum on gold is starting to look very favorable going forward on gold prices. So have a quick look at Euro dollar. Let's have a quick look back at that. And again, we've got a fairly decent rebound there. So from this, we can suggest that potentially we could be in for a little bit of a period of dollar weakness and could we'll see a retest of those peaks back in 109.40.50. Okay. Let's quickly look to see whether or not we can retest those peaks in the decks. Slightly underwhelming that. Seen a little bit of a spike higher in the DAX, but close, but no cigar. So we're still getting a fair degree of divergence between what European markets are doing and what US markets are doing. We're holding on, we're hanging on to the gains for the S&P, but it's close, but no cigar when it comes to European markets. I'm wondering how much of that is to do with the fact that the markets are thinking there's a lot more pain to come for Europe um, when it comes to their exposure to China. Obviously, we've seen a whole host of easing measures, piecemeal easing measures from Chinese authorities over the course of the past few days. We've got China trade next week, um, and they're likely that's likely to be another set of fairly weak numbers, imports and exports. And we've also got China CPI and China PPI as well. So again, that's likely to feed into the deflation narrative that um, has been um, coming out pretty much from China for most of this year, well, actually for all of this year when it comes to PPI as well. So just going to check to make sure that there are no further questions um, before I wind this up. Um, I think I think I think we're pretty much done. Um, okay, Nasdaq. I think I did Nasdaq, didn't I, Liam? So I think we're pretty much covered on that. It does appear to be fairly resilient, and it does look as if we're probably going to retest those highs. The bigger test will be whether or not we take those highs out. Any other questions, ladies and gents? Okay, well, in the absence of any other questions and um, any other queries about what's coming over the course of the next couple of weeks, because obviously the next time I do one of these will be in October, and hopefully we'll find out whether or not I was right about the fact that we've got no more rate hikes coming. Um, I'll wind this up. In the next couple of days, you'll receive an email um, asking for feedback. I would be really grateful if you could feedback positive or negative because the whole purpose of these things is for your benefit, you know, a bit of Q&A, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, what would you like, what else would you like me to cover, um, trading ideas, stuff like that, because at the end of the day, this is about the only opportunity I get to speak to you guys on a monthly basis and it's a useful exercise from my point of view. Uh, when it comes to feeding back what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like to see, what you don't want to see, and so on and so forth. Anyway, that's it for this week. Have a great weekend, everyone, or this month, I should say. Have a great 
have a great weekend. Check out my weekly videos um, for my week ahead because I usually do an awful lot of um, a little bit of technical analysis on those. Um, you can find that on the news and analysis section of the website. Otherwise, I'd like to wish you all a great weekend. Don't forget it's a US holiday on Monday. It's Labor Day, so trading on Monday is probably going to be thinner than usual. Have a great weekend and speak to you all same time, same place uh, next month. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend.